Hello, everyone. Can I have your attention, please? We're going to start the next session here in the ballroom. Uh, this session is uh, business essentials for your practice. Downstairs in the amphitheater, we're going to start the session for emerging trends in mental health challenges. We also have the ultrasound workshop uh, for kidney, urinary, and bladder in the Monarch room. And we have the sutures workshop again downstairs in the Hinsdale room. So if everyone can please uh, proceed to your uh, chosen session. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. Avarasma Ashar Mubarak Niwazma Molaye Molana Alina Kalam Mubarak Ma Si Barakat Lene Bayan Farmaya. Emma Molana Ali Farmaveche Tabla Toghina Fa Wajtahu Fi Rida Bil Qalil. I sought monetary success and I found it by being happy with less. Mola has continually encouraged us to be business minded. Our success as individuals and as a community lie in entrepreneurship, and this holds true even for the traditionally professional fields such as healthcare. So in that spirit, SBMA is uh, proud to present a distinguished panel to discuss medical entrepreneurship featuring Dr. Najmuddin Bai Karimji, Dr. Uh, Yakuta Ben Patni, Dr. Salma Ben Saiger, and Dr. Ahmed Jamali. So without any further ado or additional biographies, to, uh, we're just gonna just jump straight in. So. Our session is informal. It's mainly set up as a question answer session. I think if somebody has a question, something that they're interested in starting, uh, ideas that they want, problems that they face, I think if you pose it, uh, both the panelists can give you some guidelines, ideas. We can sort of th think through the problem. Uh, we'll have participation from the audience. And I think it'll be very productive that way, uh, rather than giving you a lecture on starting a business. There's a lot of uh, information most people already know, but I think uh, if there are problems, like you said, you face, the odds are there may be others who will either face those problems or are facing those problems. Oh, yeah. So um, I'm an internist. I've been in practice almost 30 years. Uh, in Houston, I have... Uh, eight offices. Uh, we utilize a combination of physician and physician assistants. Um, we have uh, four physicians and we have uh, somewhere around 18, 19, 20 physician extenders between the eight offices. Uh, we've got a huge staff, support staff, a uh, total of about 150, 160 people. And uh, we're primary care. We're very traditional in our practice. We do purely outpatient uh, practice. Um, and I think uh, if practices are run uh, reasonably with good prudence, primary care, unlike what anybody has sort of probably drilled into you, um, has a lot of value. It is very lucrative. And there are many opportunities, even practicing good traditional medicine, as long as you balance it correctly. And it gives you lots of time. It gives you a chance to balance work life, uh, take enough time off. And so I think everybody who's starting, who's looking for careers, is always thinking about that. Sometimes they ex accept uh, um, uh, positions in group practices or hospital-based practices, trying to balance that. And my bias, I could tell you after 30 years, is that really nobody's going to give you the liberty of running your practice and working more than you will yourself. So just keep that in mind when you're looking for stability, balancing your financial needs, probably doing better than you would in a group practice or an employment practice, and ultimately, Jim Molanu from Anchem, having your own practice. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Amr Jamali. I'm a, a specialist. I'm a cardiologist and interventional cardiologist. Uh, in the Los Angeles area. I've been in, uh, run my private practice for about 16 years. Uh, we have five doctors, three nurse practitioners. 
uh, 20 some odd staff um, in an area that is um, highly, um, uh, highly penetrated by employed physicians, by large healthcare systems. Alhamdulillah, we've been able to uh, be successful as a uh, private practice in a uh, high level uh, consultative field. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that and, and, and uh, open to questions. Hi, I'm Salma Saiger, Dallas Ma Internal Medicine, private practice chair for the last 13 years. Uh, solo practitioner with three nurse practitioners on board. Uh, do clinical research for the last five years, also in the clinical practice. And uh, that has also, of course, grown to a full uh, business, uh, uh, thanks to COVID. Um, and a th mother of three kids also. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yakuta Patni. I'm a family practice physician. Um, I have a different course than them. I was uh, employed in academic and then private practice for almost 16 years before I decided to do my own private practice. Um, it just started three, four years ago, right before COVID. Um, I'm a geriatrician and I got wound care certified. It's a little bit different uh, than what most people do. Um, I have uh, privileges in multiple hospitals and I also do palliative care. Um, to support my business, I started a technology platform for the nuances of documentation and that has started to pick up. So. I'm glad that I started with clinical uh, on my own and then it branched off to a whole different thing. So would be happy to answer any questions. So why don't we start with questions from the audience. Uh, if anyone has any, I can give you the mic. So Dr. Karimji, you have a lot of uh, so, I want to know how much of stress level do you have of whether any one particular clinic is handled in, you know, in a financial way, in the medical way, meaning no negligence, with so many clinics going on. How do you divide that? So, you know, it's important to have a good uh, team uh, in terms of uh, somebody who you can delegate in terms of some of the administrative responsibilities, some of the contracting, the, the billing, the um, oversight, the, um, the specific responsibilities. Your job as a physician should be just making sure that everything is running like it should, right? That there are no fall throughs. Um, just like in any practice, even if you have a physician partner, you don't know everything that's going on in the practice with every patient. Your assumption is that if you run into issues, you will identify that there is a problem here and then you want to address that very effectively. So I think uh, recognizing that there are a lot of people that have wonderful talents, both medical and non-medical, get the people that also have the non-medical talents and make sure that you've got a good number on board, set up good protocols. Processes are very, very important. Um, uh, do you want to answer that? <laughs> so, so the answer is that, remember, nobody starts off here, right? They all start at a certain point, and, and as it grows, some things become very natural, some things you need to uh, there may require a little more skill, a little more thinking, but over time, it all tends to work out, you know. Uh, one other comment is that, you know, sp a lot of the younger physicians, as they finish residency, they feel like, look, I, I, I don't understand this. I really got to get this right. I need to get experience. I can promise you, once you get comfortable with making the money you do and your lifestyle expects that and demands that, 
it's going to be very, very hard to jump into a private practice. The best time to do that is when you're fresh out of residency, start a practice, you can always do a little locums, moonlighting, work with somebody else to subsidize your startup. You're used to your fifty, sixty thousand dollars and you will easily make that even if you just do locums or this or that. And so that's really, and, and, and at that point, you're hungry, you're motivated to work hard, and that's really the time to start your own practice. I think my bias is that people that get into a practice, um, private practice or a group practice, and then decide to jump into private practice, it's a huge transition because they need the money. They're expecting it. They are, you know, they've got commitments and they just can't fall back on not making that or having that insecurity. Let's just say a word about that. Um, as a specialist uh, physician uh, coming out into um, private practice, um, as a specialist, you're, you have uh, two sets of, of clients, really. You have your patients, who, who are clients who come to you, and you have your referring doctors. Uh, who you need to keep happy. And your referring doctors, to be very honest, they don't know uh, really if what you're doing is right. They, they, they don't know the nuances of the data behind what type of stent you're going to use or, or when you're going to do a, a TAVR on somebody. They depend on you uh, for that. So they're not really concerned about that. What they're concerned is about my... Um, one of my mentors, when I came out into private practice, said the four A's, availability and availability. He said that twice. You have to always be available. <laughs> Affability, you've got to be nice. <laughs> and last is ability. Try not to kill people. So, so when you're coming out of residency there's, or fellowship as a specialist physician, there is really the ideal time to go into private practice because A, you haven't gotten used to that lifestyle, you're not making as big a leap, and B, you already have what it takes, whether you realize it or not. So I would like to add to what he said about starting it sooner. I think I started after almost 16 years of employment and um, to go into doing it all on your own is much harder and once you do it you realize that you could have done it much sooner. The, the things that you're scared about they don't change really with time. You already know your clinical uh, work. Uh, what you really have to learn is what happens on the administrative side, how you're getting paid. Um, when I started, I got into trouble with my biller uh, because that's how you make money. You have to build an insurance company. You have to get into the right contracts. And so it took me over a year and a half of poor billing uh, practices to learn billing. And so now I'm my own biller. I, I manage all my contracts. Um, I know exactly between Blue Cross, Humana, whatever we have here, all the ACOs, how to become part of that, how to negotiate contracts, and I know exactly to what cent the money's coming in and the money's going out. If you start your private practice, you have to understand billing, and I, I can't emphasize because it's just getting extremely hard. So you could do it any time. So I don't know how many students are here, how many private practitioners are here, how many employed physicians are here that are thinking of you know doing their own thing, but th those are the most important things that'll keep you balanced. Um, so that's the only thing I wanted to add. Everybody who's been in private practice has had trouble with the biller. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and very few realize it till you actually go through everything. And I'm sure these people have learned over time how to do your own billing. Uh, I didn't even know the difference between an ERA and an ETF, an EFT. And I was like, what is all this? How does the money come in? So. Also, also it's important that you get a good team on board. You know, Pnam Mumin Ma. There are billing companies, and there are the technology companies, and there are people that'll set up and help you pick out the EMR and 
arrange all of that. And so you should use those resources because they're very understanding. When somebody's starting new, they won't come and present you and give you a $300,000 solution because they know you're just starting. They'll give you something that is very much uh, manageable. They know you're starting. They're looking for a long-term customer. And so I think there's a lot of value in that. And um, the uh, thing that I would probably tell you different is I don't know as much about billing as probably you do, but as long as you have good people who understand it, it uh, better than you, then it works out well and your money will tell you the story. It may be that you may have left a little bit on the table, but fortunately physicians have the capacity of making a lot of money. So if they lose a little, as long as what keeps coming is good, then it doesn't matter. You don't lose sleep over that. I come down somewhere in the middle of the two. I don't know a ton about billing, but I definitely keep an eye on it after some bad experiences early in my practice. It's very easy for billers to take advantage of. It's a learning curve. So the sooner you start, it's going to be uh, better for you. Ke, you're never going to be perfect. I have done 10 years of job in the past, and I have private practice. Ma jao. Uh, whatever is your comfort. If you think out of residency, you were not 100% comfortable, uh, administrative-wise, uh, learn, get perfect in your clinical medicine first, a couple of years, then jump into the administrative duties and all those sort of things, too. But it's a constant learning curve. After 13 years, too, there is so much for me to learn every single day. Uh, it is just amazing. Okay? The opportunities that are out there for private practice is not there when you're employed. You don't even know about all those things. So just private practice, ma, you have to be very receptive to ideas and how to grow. Uh, that's the very most important thing that uh, one small thing, one small letter, one small email can start the whole one new business for you. So uh, just be receptive. You know, new graduates going into directly private practice is not easy because they don't learn admin part in their training. So I don't know how new graduates think, but when I graduated, I could not think of private practice. I had to get my experience. And additionally, mine is a surgical field, so you need a little more experience. I don't know how much it is for internal um, medicine, but it's hard for a surgical graduate to directly go into private practice. Munira, but I'll say that you have to be business-minded even at your job. So when I was doing my job, I was more into the administrator office, making up policies, changing the patient paperwork, all those sort of things I was not compensated for, but I enjoyed doing, and I knew I had a goal, money. eventually I want to be out of here and start my own. So just having that business-minded, yeah. uh, Yes, you know, mindset? but it, it's a little different when it's a surgical field because you really need somebody to mentor you into doing a lot of surgeries because you've done major surgeries under the supervision of your attendings. That's there. But if you're in the physician's lounge, you'll realize what other doctors do. And you have to emulate those things, right? Meaning in terms of whether it's surgical or cardiology or whatever those fields are, you have all the time when you're starting to sit in the staff lounge, talk to doctors, seem like a good person. It's amazing. People will tell you a lot of things while you're there. The other thing is that, you know, the people you get in billing, they'll tell you what other doctors are doing. Make sure you uh, understand that when you do this, make sure you do that. Uh, this doctor always does this. Can you, are you sure you are not supposed to do that? So these are easy lessons. They're not very expensive lessons. It's not like you lose a ton of money before you learn, you know? Let's uh, move on to another question. So I have a few questions. Um, Dr. Sabin, I want to ask you, you have, you are in practice for 30 years and you have a lot of clinics. So when you started with one clinic, when you go into another clinic, you buy a practice or you start it from scratch? This number one answers. You, uh, you buy a running practice, which is, which is not running good and something, and you already have a patient base, or you start a new practice and work on that. I have, that's number one question. Could you answer that? 
Um, so we've done both. We've started our own practices and we've bought a clinic system as well. And both have their goods and bads. Bad, yeah. uh, the advantage is if you buy a practice, you know, you've already got a patient load, you're already getting the staff, but then it's changing the culture. If you're starting a new practice, um, if you're already in an area for a while, the moment your name shows up on the different insurances with a different location, or when patients call, you know, your staff will tell them, oh, by the way, we have a location here, and you'll start seeing it. It creates value in both ways, it's good. So I don't think, I think both are good. They both have their own their specific own uh, benefits, uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, whenever you buy a practice, you will lose some of your people that you consider your providers, etc. Because uh, invariably, especially if it's a practice that's had some issues or wasn't managed effectively and you try to get everything on track to where you feel comfortable, you're going to find people are not happy with it. Some people stay, some people leave, but you know, um, if, you're, if you're comfortable with the way it, the practice should run, then you want to try to, unless you see an advantage, you know, you're going to make good decisions. You're going to normally pull them in your direction the way you know how to do a process best. Okay, another question is like when you start your own practice, you get into the billing because that's where you probably make money. So when you are in practice, pra uh, pri private practice, you said that you are not doing the billing portion of it, you're not. But I think when I went into the private practice about maybe 20 years, 25 years ago, before I was with a group, it, I didn't know anything about the billing. You know, even, even the encounter form, my nurse used to fill. But when I went into the practice, I made sure, you know, I'm filling that form. Now the EMR is, 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 is is, is that EMR has the whole thing, so you just put that code in there and it goes, and so it goes directly into the billing. My before I had an outside biller, now my nurse learned the billing because we had already had the system in the, in the EMR. And he says, I don't need to learn it. They just took some the EMR people and they just taught how to take care of it. And it was much easier and it's more effective. But the new people, I'm talking about the new generation who, my, I had four partners. They all were not able to sell the practice because the new physicians are not, does not want to go into the private practice. And the last one who is, uh, uh, who is leaving, I had to convince one of our uh, um, community person to get into it. It's really, once you go into private practice, then you realize it how, much it is different than, than working for somebody. There is, you, there is no, no comparison. So unless a new, new, new generation who is looking, because everybody feels like once I work for somebody, I'll have the enough money. And they don't feel it that once you start your new practice, it will be maybe difficult for a year, but then after that, it is much more, much more, uh, um, effective, lucrative. lucrative, effective, and is you have your your own time. Can I make a comment on that, uh, Rashid? If you don't mind. Um, first of all, I want to ask uh, the audience: How many people here are private practice, and how many are employed? Can you raise your hand if you're private practice? And can you raise your hand if you're employed or other? All right. So, with no disrespect to anybody who's employed, but I have about a total of about 25 employees, counting physicians, advanced practice practitioners, and staff. And I can say with confidence that in an ideal world, every single one of them who works for me, works for me because they bring more value to the practice than what I pay them, right? Either in terms of money, or in terms of efficiency, or in terms of other types of value. Because if the opposite was true, if I was paying them more than the value they brought to the practice, I wouldn't keep employing them. So it stands to reason that any time that you are employed at anything, physician aside, you are almost by definition working for less than what you are worth, right? You are bringing your employer more value than what he's paying you or he or she is paying you. And that's a definitional thing. So I think once you start looking at it from that perspective that you are 
not being paid what you are worth by definition, it starts changing your calculus about making the jump to private practice or not. Go ahead. It's absolutely a trade-off. There are, I won't say more worries, there are different sets of worries when you have your own practice. When, you, when you're employed also, you, you have worries. Or can, I, can I get time off? Can I, uh, you know, uh, will I be fired? Uh, I be fired? Uh, what's my boss gonna say about X, Y, Z? What about my schedule? What if he makes me see 16 patients instead of 14 patients? So there, there's worries both ways. But yes, there is absolutely a trade-off. Let's uh, move on. We, so we just started private practice just a couple of years ago. Um, and um, the issue is, it's, there's no doubt private practice is better. But the problem is like the coverage, right? Like, you know, at night, like, you know, if you're solo practice as a consultant, let's say, and like I know uh, nephrologists who are solo practice, they're working 24 seven, the whole day and night. And that's, I think, the major issue that newly grads are facing. When you start, there's a lot more energy for you to work hard. And you'll work hard even in a group practice because your seniors will expect you to do more work, take more call anyway. Now, having said that, the odds are that that, that other nephrologist who's working 24-7 probably needs a break too, and the odds are they would be probably happy to share some. It'll create value for you in that it'll give you some patience. It'll create a value for them in that they'll get a little time off. So the answer is, I'm telling you, hands down, that, you know, that private practice, I, I really think, has a lot more value in terms of giving you independence, giving you uh, better long-term experience, better long-term uh, peace of mind, greater satisfaction, greater uh, comfort in determining how your practice is going to look like, uh, better in terms of your schedule, better in terms of um, when you need to take time off at short notices. You know, uh, if you're good with working with others, the answer is that there's a lot of people that'll want to work with you, you know, and they'll be willing to be there for you to help you because you're also there to serve a need for them. Um, this question might, this may not be the forum for it and it may potentially even have a session of its own or it's maybe that expansive, but <clears throat> something I've heard more and more about are equity companies or investment companies coming in buying out practices where you have a private practice but then now it's, there, there's a takeover basically by a firm, but is there, you know, I realize that there could be a loss of independence there, but are there any models that could be beneficial for both, you know, sides of the partnership, or is that something that in general you should try to shy away from? Can I answer? Yes, but I get at least once a month an offer like that from companies like Privia and Oak Street and RealMed sort of a thing they want to, they know that you have the database and they want to buy your practice and Dr. Saiga, you become the employed physician now and we'll give you six weeks off and all those sort of things. But no, look at the, I've checked it out once, horrible contract, uh, they will take you out uh, in a matter of minutes. The, you completely lose the respect, you completely lose the autonomy, the flexibility, everything. You just become a mere employee for them. So shy away from them. They uh, Maybe towards the very retirement stage when you are thinking, okay, now I really want to retire and uh, there's no, children are not gonna follow your legacy. At that time, if you think that, okay, maybe it's time for me to cash out, uh, it might be good at that time, but earlier on, if you think no, uh, even if you have 10 years to give more to your practice, stay with your practice. Maybe in the last one or two years, 
maybe at that time. I couldn't agree more. We have a very aggressive company in our area who is buying out uh, practices, and I would put that time frame at about three years. What they're doing is they're giving you a sweetheart deal for three years that looks phenomenal. Um, and then at the end of three years, when they own the practice, they own all the cards, they're ratcheting up your expectations on RVUs, they're ratcheting up your expectations on call and all that stuff, and if you can't take it, uh, you're out. So I wouldn't do it for more than three years. I have a quick question about, or uh, response in that. You know, right now there's a lot of venture capital. There are a lot of different models that are being tested. There's uh, value models. There's all of this. There's a lot of these large organizations have an entry model and an exit model. They're going in with this idea that they build a huge revenue stream and then they expect to sell it off to some larger systems. So I can tell you that they're all in transitions. I've been in the business long enough to know where hospitals have tried to buy practices. They had their own practices, but at least in primary care, that has failed. Now again, it's happening, you know, and yes, the economics may be different, et cetera, but a lot of it is trying to control the direction of the movement of the patient. Um, I'd just like to make a quick comment on the venture capitalists. Um, so, when I have to keep a business-minded, right? So, the business-minded aspect, if someone's coming to ask and want to purchase your practice, it means your practice has value. And you see that value for yourself, and I think that Dr. Kaida actually, that's 100% right. And there may come a time where you feel that there is a business benefit for you there to sell it out there. I think you always keep your options open. Um, and, but you're right, venture capitalists are always out there, so you have to understand your own value before you, you entertain that. I want to go back briefly to that surgical comment, because I am a surgeon in private practice. And I think Munira Ben and Salma Ben were both right on that, in the sense that there is a time frame of getting comfortable, and I think all of you mentioned that before, but at the same time, Jim Salma Ben, you stay business-minded, and your comfort time frame is actually building yourself to get ready to go into practice and looking at it just as another training period. I have a quick comment on that. Uh, after being employed by academic centers, private practice, and then now um, I have three kids, um, now going into private practice after this much time, I would say that even as a surgical specialty, I'm not a surgeon, but I have other friends, going into private practice first, you learn so much that when you eventually want to get employed, you will be able to better negotiate what they're giving you because when you outright go into an employed position, they talk about RVUs, um, they, call, they talk about work RVUs, dollar per RVU, they give you a set you know, uh, criteria on the, what they would pay you, there is all these other things, 10% for quality, they take that out. So all those things, you don't really understand what it is and you just sign the contract because then they're willing to give you a bonus. But the thing is that if you do, if you are in a surgical specialty and you do start off actually learning the hard way what it is and how they capitalize, how administrators, hospital systems, how they set up their systems where they keep 60% of what you actually make or then make for them between the facility fees and whatever else they have, you are actually in a better position to negotiate a contract at the outset. And you know that would, in the end, become a better option for you if you decide to stay employed or your surgical procedures are in such a way that you need a bigger hospital system, you need staff, you need all kinds of different kinds of things that you can't do on your own, uh, which I don't think it's likely, but you know, I would say do it the reverse way, which would kind of be better for you to negotiate that you're not taken advantage of, you know? Um, Let's uh, take one last question, just in the interest of time. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Um, so, in light of the you know the current uh, state of healthcare and the consolidation that we just talked about, you know, like uh, for people entering the field now, students, residents coming in now, for a lot of us, it may seem probably harder than ever to start your own practice because of all these things going on. Absolutely, uh, like it all has to do with things. You're you're talking from a perspective of 
you've already started the practice at a time when it was maybe fa more favorable than it is now. So my question is generally, what words of encouragement would you give people who are just starting out now their medical careers in this current climate uh, on how they should pursue private practice? I would like to answer that. I can tell you 30 years ago when I started practice, people joining group practices was becoming the standard. All right, whether it was because of better lifestyles, better this, better that, but I can tell you hands down, it's no different today. And if you're assuming that, well, things are different, they are absolutely not. You know, the insurances have the same interest for their patient. They're interested in good economics. If you serve them well and you take care of their patients well, they are willing to give you lots and lots of information. And they're there, not necessarily to guide your practice, but they'll give you enough feedback. You know, look, you're doing what you're doing because you're smart. And if you can apply some of that smartness to just, and, and it's basic common sense, to just good practice, I can promise you, you will do at least as good as somebody who's willing to pay you. Now, business is all about investment and ROI. And when you, when you become employed, uh, you are trading um, things like a secure paycheck and uh, initially a good lifestyle. Um, whereas when you're in private practice, you're working a heck of a lot harder and the first couple of years are going to be lean, right? But there's, that's an investment. That's an investment that you are uh, uh, putting in because overall in the future, you're going to be better off from a financial perspective and better off from a lifestyle uh, perspective without a cap on uh, where you can go. People have talked about the death of private practice for as long as I've been in private practice. When I joined private practice, and I said, why are you joining private practice? It's dead. The fact of the matter is there's always going to be a piece of the pie that's going to be there for it. There's going to be different models, employed models, HMO models, uh, different models, but there will always be a private practice model. There's no reason you shouldn't be in it. Yeah, and I, with all the healthcare cuts, I think that's what you were meaning. There's still the pie in a private practice is bigger than the employed position. So, uh, E&M codes na value kam thay gache, procedures na thora thay gache, but then there's they add so many. We didn't have telemedicine 20 years ago, right? Now there's so much telemedicine that you can do. We didn't have chronic care management. Uh, what, seven years ago? Six, seven years yeah, ago it started? Like That's yeah. my most uh, <coughs> highest uh, revenue source now. Remote after, uh, yeah, after my level four visit. So uh, it, uh, there's a lot to do that was not there. So never to worry about. And I will add that when you have your own practice, the reason I decided to leave and actually left right before the pandemic, it wasn't the best thing, but what it opens up is other things that your employment contract forbids you to do, okay? So that, there's just this clinical side, but I also do a lot of utilization management for different insurance companies, which I could not have done. I also do, a lot of um, Medicare kind of work for the state of Illinois, which I could not do when I was employed because that is not allowed. Your employer has to sign off. There's a conflict of interest. So if you own your practice, you have to understand that there will be money that would come in from clinical work, but it opens up a lot of different options for you in a non-clinical setting. And that you don't know about till you are open to looking at different things that are out there where they need physicians, they need your input. Um, and so I would keep it really open uh, because revenue can come from many different ways and you can contribute in different ways. And it also gives you a break and it gives you a balance. You don't always have to just see patients, you know? So there are very different ways of thinking about it. I just think uh, that we'd like to probably have to close the uh, session at this point, but we would like to thank all of our panelists and apologies. We could definitely have had a much longer discussion, but in the interest of time, uh, you know, thank you very much for joining us, all of you.